On June 20th, 2011, Valve announced the Uber update. In a short blog post, Valve revealed that the update would center around the long-anticipated Meet the Medic short, and that the update would be the most ambitious update in the history of TF2. To celebrate, Valve announced that TF2 would be temporarily free to play for the next week, starting on the day of the announcement. Over the next four days, Valve would go on to reveal a record 22 new weapons spread across 8 new item sets. Then, when the update went live, Valve quietly added a second batch of bonus items, including weapons in a new orange-bordered strange quality that tracked the amount of kills obtained using them. As undeniably large as the Uber update was, no number of new items would earn it its ambitious title. What would do that, however, was a shocking reveal that came on the final day of the update. On June 23rd, 2011, Valve officially released the Uber update, and with it, the Meet the Medic short. But this wasn't any normal Meet the Team short. When the video came to a close, the screen cut to black, revealing a groundbreaking announcement. TF2 was going free to play. Not for a day, not for a week, but forever. It's hard to overstate just how big of a deal this was at the time. With the release of the Man Economy update, and then the free-to-play announcement, TF2 had effectively shed the traditional single-purchase business model that had ruled the gaming industry for decades. In its place was an almost unheard of system that relied entirely on free-to-play players spending money in an in-game item shop. In a way, it was a massive gamble, a huge bet by Valve on themselves that their crazy hat store was something more than just a silly experiment. And yet, it was a bet that was so perfectly calculated. Valve already knew how profitable the Manco store was, and they understood that the store's biggest limitation was simply the number of players willing to get past TF2's paywall in the first place. Thus, when Valve made TF2 free to play, thousands of players discovered TF2 for the first time, many of whom were instantly hooked by the economy and became some of Valve's best paying customers. At the time, however, not everyone was excited by the news. Many who paid for the game were naturally resentful of new free to play players and were frustrated to learn that their only reward for buying the game was a non tradable proof of purchase hat. Others lamented having to deal with new traders, who started out with free accounts that prevented them from trading items they received as random drops, leading to trades that fell through before they could even get started. Although some went so far as to proclaim the free-to-play update as the death of the game, the reality was quite the opposite. Not only did the update sweep aside any remaining fear that TF2 was on its last legs, but it put in place a business model that could stand the test of time. With each new update, new free-to-play players discovered the game, replaced burned-out veterans, and kept the game alive and thriving for decades to come. In many ways, the free-to-play update saved TF2. As TF2's player base soared, so did the number of players interested in the economy. Hats were practically synonymous with TF2, and everyone wanted to obtain items for themselves. How they did this, however, varied by player. Some players simply chose to buy items outright. They unboxed crates, spent money in the Manco store, and trolled trade servers for good deals or items they couldn't find elsewhere. Because these players put their own money into the game, they tended to be older and had more disposable income they could spend on TF2. They also tended to play the game first and foremost, and bought items to keep, rather than trade away. A second group of players had a different philosophy. Rather than spend money on the game, they became hooked on the idea of getting the best items by learning the market and making smart trades. These players were typically younger, often motivated by a lack of disposable income, and came to be known as profit traders. Although these traders would attract a negative stigma for being so self-absorbed in such an allegedly inconsequential niche of the game, profit traders truly served as the backbone of the economy, making it possible for casual players to obtain the items they truly wanted. Lucky for profit traders, this was the easiest time to get into trading in the history of TF2. From April 2011 to October 2012, the price of keys remained extremely stable, rarely budging from a price of 2.33 refined metal. Perhaps more importantly, however, this price was extremely affordable, allowing any player to obtain keys without investing money into the game. 
players could simply save up weapon drops for a month or two, craft them into metal, and then trade that metal for keys. Although free players had to upgrade their accounts to get full access to trading, they could do this by buying an item in the Manco store for less than a couple dollars, which was rarely cost prohibitive. While getting into trading was easy, learning how to trade was harder. Trade servers were the epicenter of trading activity at the time, and becoming a successful trader largely involved spending long hours on trade servers, watching other traders, and learning by trial and error. Profit trading required a lot of initiative to seek out knowledge, and it wasn't for everybody. By this time, the TF2 economy had developed two distinct fields of trading, low-tier trading and unusual trading. Low-tier trading involved basic items like hats and strange weapons, and was seen as the commoner's form of trading. Unusual trading was more exclusive. Unless you got lucky enough to unbox an unusual yourself, the only way to obtain an unusual was to trade for one. This, however, wasn't easy. If you started with less than a key in your inventory, trading up to even one of the cheapest unusuals required making at least 15 keys in profit, a feat only possible by truly mastering the low tier market. For most players, getting to this level was a long journey, a journey that started by learning simple, repetitive trading strategies. Perhaps the single most popular technique was a method called scrap banking. In the crafting system, any two weapons could be crafted into a piece of scrap metal, so every weapon was effectively worth half a scrap. However, not all weapons were equally as desirable. As such, a good trader could sell certain weapons for a scrap each, and then trade that scrap for two regular weapons, gaining one weapon each time. Other popular techniques included key banking, the process of converting keys back and forth to metal, and hat banking, which involved flipping craftable hats. With a little more experience, traders tended to move on from these basic trading strategies and started to learn more of the market, often finding their own little niche of the economy to specialize in. Regardless of approach, low-tier trading took a very long time. Most trades net less than a refined in profit, and in practice it could take weeks, if not months, to trade up to an unusual. For many, however, this process was undeniably worth it. Obtaining an unusual was seen as the ultimate accomplishment, and trading up could be incredibly fun and rewarding, especially for players who wouldn't have otherwise been able to afford the items they were trading for. This process of trading up from rags to riches was aptly dubbed a scrap to unusual and took inspiration from the real life story One Red Paperclip, where a Canadian blogger managed to trade a single red paperclip all the way up to a house. Naturally, the concept of a scrap to unusual was incredibly influential, and in time it felt like every trader had the same goal in mind. Those who made it to unusual trading quickly faced new challenges. Compared to low-tier trading, unusual trading was much more profitable, but also more risky. Unusual trading tended to be less formulaic, and required a broad understanding of the market at large, rather than a deep understanding of one or two aspects of the market. This was due in part to the incredible variability of unusuals. With over a hundred hats in the game, each of which could be found with more than a dozen different particle effects, the specific combination of a hat and effect was often unique. While you could sometimes get opinions from forums online, you ultimately had to evaluate each unusual for yourself, a process that involved understanding how a multitude of factors of varied importance contributed to a hat's overall desirability. The most important factor was the class of the unusual. If the hat could be worn on a popular class like soldier or scout, you could usually sell it for more than a hat for a less popular class like heavy. All class unusuals were especially desirable, since it was like getting 9 hats for the price of 1. The specific hat and effect mattered as well. Hats like the Killer's Kabuto for the Soldier or the Anger for the Sniper were popular because they looked sharp and themed well with other cosmetics. Hats like the Handyman's Handle for the Pyro or the Coupe Disaster for the Heavy were seen as less desirable because they were hard to take seriously. The most popular effects were large and flashy. Effects like Purple Energy, Green Energy, and Sunbeams were considered some of the best due to their bright, clean auras, and Burning Flames and Scorching Flames, effects that engulfed 
the entire head and fire were widely seen as the best of the best. Other smaller effects were cheaper, such as purple and green confetti, with the comically bad mass flies effect rounding out the bottom. Valve would go on to add more effects over time, and the series an effect came from came to be relevant as well. For instance, any effect released in the Manconomy update was considered a first generation effect, and was typically more desirable than newer effects since they were older and less widely available. Finally, the equip region of an unusual was important as well. Throughout TF2's early history, most masks, headbands, and other head accessories were classified as hats, reflective of the fact the game started out with a single headgear cosmetic slot. However, starting in December 2010, Valve began to update the equip region of some of their more dubious hats, converting them to miscellaneous items in an effort to promote cosmetic compatibility. While Valve may have seen this as an innocuous house cleaning measure, it had a massive impact on the unusual market. If a hat available in the unusual quality was updated to become a misc, it could now be equipped in addition to another unusual, allowing players to mix and match multiple effects at the same time. This added utility made unusual mists incredibly popular, and any new unusual mists immediately skyrocketed in price. Most unusuals came to be classified into three distinct categories. Low tier unusuals, high tier unusuals, and god tier unusuals. The vast majority of unusuals were low tier. These unusuals consisted of single class hats that either looked ugly, had a poor effect, or both. High tier unusuals were less common, and were typically single class hats with sought after effects, or unusual mists and all class hats with low tier effects. While the price of unusuals fluctuated over time, most low tiers tended to sell for less than a couple buds, the equivalent of less than $50, whereas high tier unusuals could fetch as much as 10 to 15 buds, or about $300 at the time. God tier unusuals, on the other hand, were an entirely different breed of unusual. Consisting of the best looking hats and mists with top notch effects, god tier unusuals could fetch ridiculous prices. No god tier, however, was as iconic and expensive as the Burning Flames Team Captain. A tri class hat for the soldier, heavy, and medic, the Team Captain was regarded as one of the best looking hats in the game, and combined with Burning Flames, the hat was virtually unmatched in the eyes of early traders. As such, the Team Captain could fetch an astonishing price of over 100 buds, the equivalent of nearly $3,000 at the time. That said, it's worth noting that early traders were somewhat hesitant to shell out large sums of money on virtual items. TF2 was paving new ground, and although the Burning Flames Team Captain was clearly one of the best items in the game, it was tough to convince people to spend $100 on virtual items, let alone $3,000. For this reason, as the economy gained more legitimacy over time, the price of the Burning Flames Team Captain quickly climbed, reaching a price of over $15,000 at its peak. Just as the goal of low tier trading was to obtain an unusual, the goal of unusual trading was typically to obtain a god tier unusual. However, just like low tier trading, this process took a long time, albeit for different reasons. While low tier trading took time because each trade only net a small amount of profit, unusual trading took time because unusuals were expensive and less people could afford them. Although individual trades could bring in over a bud profit, traders would often have to wait weeks or even months for the right offer to come along. Even if an unusual trader never managed to trade up to a god tier unusual, many still acquired incredibly expensive backpacks filled with some of the game's most coveted items. For many, this was the point in their life cycle where they'd consider cashing out and converting their TF2 wealth into real world money. As exciting as turning a hobby like TF2 trading into real money might sound, cashing out was a risky process. Most likely for legal and financial reasons, Valve didn't allow players to sell items directly for real money, and players had to turn to PayPal as an alternative. While PayPal was generally easy to use, it had one fundamental flaw. Trading TF2 items and receiving money on PayPal could not be done simultaneously. If a player wanted to sell TF2 items for cash, 
One party had to go first and send their TF2 items or PayPal money before receiving anything in return, trusting that the other party would follow through on their end of the bargain. Unfortunately, not everybody did. If you sent your TF2 items and the other person never paid you, you could lose a fortune. Once more, even if you received the money as promised, the other party could still initiate a PayPal chargeback and revoke their payment at a later date. Since PayPal didn't officially support virtual items, even if you contacted support to get the chargeback reversed, PayPal wouldn't always side with you. While traders relied on reputation threads to avoid some of the most blatant fraud, cash traders were far from able to eliminate PayPal scams in their entirety. Cash trading wasn't the only way to get scammed. As long as TF2 items held real value, there would always be scammers looking to steal your items. One of the most prevalent scams was a simple phishing scam. Someone would link you to a fake Steam login page and convince you to sign in. If you did, the scammer would hijack your account and trade all of your items to them. The practice of sharking was prevalent as well. Since trading information could be hard to come by, nefarious traders would lie about item prices to trick new players into accepting wildly unbalanced trades. While most sharks claimed innocence, insisting that the other party was fully aware of the consequences of the trade, the fact that some got away trading craft hats for unusuals would speak otherwise. Although many sensationalized scams at the time, the actual probability of getting scammed was much lower than the prevailing wisdom would suggest. As unfortunate as scams were, they were just a small part of an otherwise flourishing economy, an economy backed up by exciting new updates and content from Valve. Following TF2's free-to-play announcement in mid-2011, Valve's top priority was to get as many new players to spend money on the game as possible, and that meant trying out new and exciting things. Every few weeks, Valve added new crates to the game, featuring a mix of new and old items. While most crates followed a generic formula, containing some combination of hats, weapons, and tools, Valve continued to experiment with theme crates. Coinciding with the 2011 Steam Summer Sale, Valve released the Refreshing Summer Cooler, a limited crate that could only be opened during the course of the sale. Not long after, Valve introduced the first ever Salvage Crate, a special type of crate with a reduced drop rate. Because of their incredible rarity, any items unboxed out of a Salvage Crate, such as the Strange Kritzkrieg or Strange Gunslinger, were disproportionately expensive compared to their non-salvaged brethren. That summer, Valve released their second generation of unusual effects. These new effects appeared in all crates released after August 2011, restricting first-gen effects to the first 25 crates added to the game. Although new effects were exciting, most second-gen effects were considerably less distinctive than first-gen effects and ended up being fairly low tier. In early October, the Maniversary update added a second miss slot to the loadout menu. This change allowed players to equip a hat and up to two other non-conflicting garments at the same time, making it increasingly clear that cosmetics weren't just limited to hats or accessories. Coats, pants, and every other type of wearable item was fair game for a future update. But Valve wouldn't stop there. Over the next few years, Valve would debut some of their most innovative items to date, starting with their annual Halloween updates. In 2011, the Very Scary Halloween Special introduced TF2's first ever costume sets. While TF2's items had always been rather eccentric, these costumes featured some of the wackiest items to date, such as a massive fly mask for the engineer and a pair of werewolf paws for the demo man. Because of their absurd nature, these costumes could only be worn during the Halloween season, solidifying the precedent that Halloween items could be much wackier than regular cosmetics, so long as they were holiday restricted. That said, this was something that Valve would ultimately walk the line on in the future, increasingly adding unrestricted items that many argued broke the original art style of the game. At the time, however, Halloween costumes were generally well received, as they could be obtained simply by playing during the update. They could also be found in a new green haunted quality, which other than being rare, were functionally identical to their regular versions. In 2012, the Spectral Halloween Special introduced a new kind of item called Halloween Spells. 
like paint cans, spells were single-use items that could be applied to other items, in this case granting them a small cosmetic particle effect. This effect could range from spawning ghosts when you killed a player, turning your sentry rockets into pumpkins, or following your TF2 character around with fiery footprints. While spells were very unique, they suffered from being holiday restricted and being generally hard to understand. Demand for spells was relatively low, and spelled items were more of a fun gimmick than anything else. Halloween unusuals, however, were an entirely different story. First introduced in 2011 with the addition of four Halloween-themed unusual effects, Halloween unusuals were TF2's first shot at themed unusuals, and they proved to be a massive success. Headlined by effects like Cloudy Moon, Halloween unusuals were incredibly flashy and unique, and could only be unboxed during the course of a Halloween event, making them extremely rare and expensive. Valve would go on to introduce new effects nearly every year, and unboxing soon became one of the most anticipated parts of the Halloween season. If unusuals were the standout items of Halloween updates, festive weapons were the equivalent standouts of Christmas updates. In 2011, Valve brought back the Australian Christmas update, this time adding two new crates, the Nice Winter Crate and the Naughty Winter Crate. While the Nice Crate contained some of the best winter-themed cosmetics yet, the Naughty Crate stole the spotlight, containing 10 cosmetic weapons wrapped in festive lights. While festive weapons were a simple concept, they were an instant hit. Practically everyone wanted to own their own set of festive weapons, and the rare strange versions could sell for a small fortune on trade servers. Due to their incredible popularity, the Naughty and Nice crates returned in 2012, 2013, and 2014, with each year giving players a new set of festive weapons to fight over. The biggest update of the era, however, didn't come until August 2012, with the release of the groundbreaking Man vs. Machine update. While the update focused on TF2's first ever co-op game mode, the update did impact the economy in a few ways. First, in order to play Man vs. Machine, or MVM for short, players had to pay entry in the form of a new item called a Tour of Duty ticket. Although tickets could be purchased in the Manco store for a dollar, many players turned to trading as a means to obtain them without spending money on the game. Secondly, the update introduced Bot Killer Weapons, a new kind of cosmetic weapon given out to players for completing MVM tours. These weapons featured a robotic head attached to the end of each weapon, and came with different head styles depending on the difficulty of the tour completed. Because the best styles were the most difficult to obtain, higher tier bot killers were more expensive, and incentivized players to play MVM with the hopes of making a profit. While bot killers were popular upon release, they were ultimately outclassed by better looking reskins like festive weapons, and their prices fell as they flooded the market. With the success of recent updates, the TF2 economy was thriving. Players were buying items, trading and unboxing left and right, and Valve was clearly making a boatload of money off it. It seemed that Valve had found the perfect update formula, one that would both excite players and cultivate a strong item economy that worked for everyone. But just as the game was changing, so was the economy around it. As the era progressed, the rise of new trading tools fundamentally changed the way players interacted with the economy, and traders had to adapt to survive. Perhaps the most important trading tool that arose during this era can be best understood by learning about the demise of an existing tool, TF2 Spreadsheet. Prior to 2012, TF2 Spreadsheet was the primary source of pricing information in the community. While it undeniably helped traders during its prime, a simple spreadsheet had its limitations. Information was compiled by a single entity, and each item had to be individually researched and updated. In addition, the primary maintainer of the spreadsheet chose to remain anonymous, making the website an easy target of alleged price manipulation and other conspiracy theories. These attacks reached a peak in the summer of 2012, when a lengthy expose was published on Reddit, dictating years worth of price fixing and reputation falsifications. Although most of the claims were later proven to be erroneous, the spreadsheet owner could do little to defend himself. People latched on to what the post had to say, and the spreadsheet soon entered a downward spiral. In retrospect, the spreadsheet's business model was fundamentally flawed. Even if the owner was public about his identity, it didn't matter how unbiased his prices were, people would always find them suspicious because it was one guy recording prices without any large-scale community input. 
Once more, with hundreds if not thousands of items being added each year, manually updating each item proved to be incredibly time consuming, tedious, and often error prone. A new solution for item pricing needed to be found. That solution arrived in mid-2012 with the introduction of a new trading website called Backpack.tf. To price items, Backpack.tf introduced a revolutionary new concept called a price suggestion. If a user noticed a certain item selling for a specific price, they could suggest a price change by providing proof of recent sales. The community would then upvote the suggestion if they deemed it reflective of the current market, and if accepted, that price would eventually become part of the website's pricing database. The solution was ingenious for two reasons. First, it turned over pricing to the community, distributing power to a large group of people instead of one entity, making prices more trustworthy. And second, the new system was entirely automated, allowing developers to spend more time improving site functionality rather than just updating prices. With developers working full-time on new features, Backpack.tf evolved quickly. Before long, the website had a robust item database and inventory viewer, practically rendering the most popular alternative obsolete on the spot. The website also came with an easy-to-view unusual price list, inspiring the community to undertake the gargantuan task that TF2 spreadsheet had thus failed to accomplish, estimating prices for what were thousands of unique unusuals. Between price suggestions and all of its other features, Backpack.tf positioned itself as the Swiss army knife of trading resources and quickly became a central pillar of the economy. Just as Backpack.tf introduced a new way to price items, Steam introduced new ways to buy and sell them. In late 2011, Valve released Steam Trading, a native replacement to TF2's in-game trade window. Aside from having a more user-friendly interface, Steam Trading increased the maximum number of items you could trade to 256, making large trades feasible for the first time in history. Players could also invite each other to trade without needing to be in-game together, which made trading easier than ever before. The following year, Valve went on to introduce the Steam Community Market, allowing players to buy and sell TF2 items directly for Steam wallet funds. Although not all items were marketable, and sellers had to pay a 15% fee to use the service, the Steam Market was nonetheless very popular, as players could obtain items without the hassle of player-to-player -player trading. A website called Scrap.tf offered a different way to avoid in-person trading. Originally introduced as a way for players to buy regular weapons without having to overpay to traders, Scrap.tf allowed players to buy and sell items directly from their website, using a sleek user interface and a fleet of automated trade bots. While the site quickly accomplished its mission statement, single-handedly leading to the demise of scrap banking, the site sold most other items for largely non-competitive rates, and thus was primarily used by casual players, not profit traders. Although Scrap.tf and the Steam market were widely used, they were far from replacements to trade servers. The tool that would give trade servers a run for their money, and truly revolutionize the way items were bought and sold, was a website by the name of TF2 Outpost. At its core, the website was very simple. It introduced a basic classified system where players could list their items for sale. While TF2 Outpost wasn't the first to come up with this idea, it was the one to do it the best. Compared to its predecessor TF2 Trading Post, TF2 Outpost was faster and easier to navigate, allowing the website to reach a level of widespread adoption that TF2 Trading Post never obtained. With innovative features like item wildcards, TF2 Outpost made it painless to find the items you are looking for, practically eliminating the need to sit on trade servers, looking for specific items, or waiting on offers. In effect, TF2 Outpost single-handedly established a new trading paradigm. No longer were trade servers the epicenter of the economy, the place where most trades took place. Instead, most players preferred the offline system perfected by TF2 Outpost, choosing to engage with the economy by way of classified listings. In 2013, Valve would go on to introduce Steam Trade Offers, a way to trade with people who are not online at the same time as you. Rather than add someone you wanted to trade with on TF2 Outpost, you could simply send them a trade offer and let them think about it before accepting it, rejecting it, or sending you back a counteroffer. Trade offers turned out to be much more popular than live trading, and only increased the influence of the offline trading paradigm. While trade servers would never fully die off, 
they would continue to decline over the years, never returning to the spotlight they held back in 2010 and 2011. While the rise of websites like Backpack.tf and TF2 Outpost can be seen as rather disruptive, it's important to remember that these websites were developed to solve economic inefficiencies. Prices from TF2 spreadsheet couldn't be trusted, and finding trades on trade servers was time-consuming. From this perspective, the rise of Backpack.tf and TF2 Outpost was not only inevitable, but necessary for a thriving economy to function. These websites made trading information more readily available, in turn making trading much safer, introduced new ways for traders to make profit, and served as the backbone of the economy for years to come. Many would argue that the single characteristic that best defined the early years of the economy was the cheap, stable price of keys. At less than three refined, even the most common items like weapons and scrap metal held value compared to the key, allowing anyone to get into trading with ease. Unfortunately, not all good things last forever. In late 2012, the price of keys started rising dramatically. In December, keys passed three refined metal for the first time. By March 2013, keys had reached 4 refined metal, and by May, keys were over 5 refined each. In just 6 months, the price of keys had more than doubled, causing sharp alarm among traders. What was happening to the price of keys? The reason for this drastic change was actually quite simple. Since random weapon drops were given to players for free, and could themselves be crafted into refined metal, the supply of metal increased each year. At the same time, the number of keys in existence remained roughly the same due to unboxing, creating a large disparity between the supply of keys and metal. Simple economics dictated what happened next. As more players sought to turn their abundant supply of metal into keys, keys would sell out and sellers were forced to raise their prices. Keys would eventually settle at a higher price until they sold out again, in which case sellers would raise their prices once more, the market price would increase again, and so on and so forth. This trend would continue for years. By late 2014, keys passed 10 refined each, and in mid-2015, keys cost nearly 20 refined. While the real-world value of keys remained stable, anchored to their store price of $2.50, the real value of metal plummeted. Metal was simply too common, and nobody had a compelling use for it. While the crafting system was theoretically supposed to curb the supply of metal, craft hats had since flooded the market, and there was no longer any reason to spend 3 refined metal on a random hat when you could buy the exact hat you wanted for a little over 1 refined on the open market. The consequences of this massive inflation were twofold. First, the inflation of keys led to the deflation of other items. Because low-tier items were priced in refined metal on Backpack.tf, each time refined dropped in value, so did the monetary value of each low-tier item. While some items had enough intrinsic demand to bounce back to their previous value, most basic items like weapons and craft hats had far more supply than demand, which effectively caused their prices to depreciate as keys went up. While new players enjoyed the higher buying power of a key, veterans who held lots of low-tier items saw their backpacks lose quite a bit of value. Secondly, and most importantly, key inflation made low-tier trading harder than it used to be. With keys worth as much as 15 to 20 refined, the already grueling process of trading up could now take as much as 10 times longer, since making one ref profit was no longer halfway to a key, but now not even 10% of the way. Once more, players could no longer easily start trading using only weapon drops, since a key now cost over 300 weapons to acquire, rather than less than 50. While traders could still start trading by investing a key or two of their own money, many longed for the days when an investment wasn't necessary. Another troubling trend arose around the same time, fraudulent item duplication. During this time, if a player's account was hijacked by a scammer, they could contact Steam support to get their items restored. While the system gave players a fantastic insurance policy in theory, it was not without its drawbacks. 
because a player's original items could have been traded legitimately down the line, Valve refrained from removing any original items from circulation, instead granting hijacked players an identical copy of each item they lost. These items had the same internal item IDs, and item databases would show them existing in more than one inventory at once. While most of the time duplicated items had little to no effect on the economy, if a high tier item was duped enough times, its price could fall by hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. This is what started to occur in late 2012, instigated by a new wave of scammers looking to take advantage of Steam support. The scam itself was simple. Scammers would fake Steam support tickets, claiming the inventories full of earbuds, god tier unusuals, and other oddities were unjustly hijacked. Then, if Valve blindly restored the inventories, they would sell the new items for a profit. Although Valve eventually cracked down on these scammers by early 2013, thousands of fraudulently obtained items flooded the market in the meantime, causing outrage among high-tier traders. The combination of inflation and duplication worried many long-time traders. To them, the economy was on a downward spiral, and the best days of trading were behind them. Many cashed out and moved on with their lives. As we saw with the free-to-play update, and now again with inflation and duplication, there's a tendency among traders to cherish the past. Players are always nostalgic for when they started playing the game, and whatever the current state of the economy is, there are always those who wish they could go back to what came before it. Although veteran traders had legitimate claims about the state of the economy, many failed to realize that a different economy wasn't necessarily a bad economy. Once Valve dealt with item dupers and traders adjusted to a world with more expensive keys, many realized the new economy was just as prosperous as what came before it. Harnessing the power of websites like Backpack.tf and TF2 Outpost, the TF2 economy entered the age of information. No longer was trading advice prohibitively hard to come by. If somebody wanted to make profit, there were more ways to learn than ever before. One of the most popular methods was through YouTube. By early 2014, trading content had solidified itself on the platform led by creators like Strife, The Prophet, Spiky Mikey, and Glassy Gaming. These channels showcased new unusual unboxes, created detailed trading tutorials, and analyzed the state of the economy. No kind of video was as popular as the trade series. In these videos, a creator would document their ongoing trading journey, discussing why they made each trade, and how they were able to make a profit from it. Most series followed a scrap to unusual format, starting out with a few metal or keys, and eventually ending by obtaining a dream unusual. Trade series were often the first interaction new players had with the economy, and painted a compelling narrative that anybody could obtain riches if they put in enough time and effort. Inspired by YouTube, a new generation of traders begun to learn the economy and make profit. However, with more information available, profit traders had to increasingly compete with each other, and good deals became harder to find. In addition, the rise of sites like TF2 Outpost made buyers and sellers more visible than ever before, forcing traders to compete with the whole market rather than just the subset they found on trade servers. Despite these drawbacks, profit trading continued to thrive. The basic framework of trading remained intact, and the advent of reliable prices on Backpack.tf made unusual trading much more accessible to the masses. Once more, Valve continued to push the envelope with new updates, introducing a plethora of new items for traders to buy and sell. One of the most prominent updates was the Two Cities update. Released on November 20th, 2013, the update was the largest man versus machine update yet, and introduced two new kinds of MVM rewards that would arguably go on to have a legacy far greater than the in-game content itself. The first of these items were killstreak kits, single-use items that could be applied to existing weapons to track their current killstreak in-game. Killstreak kits came in three different tiers, and although all track killstreaks the same way, the rare, specialized, and professional kits gave the weapon an exciting new kind of cosmetic flair. Specialized kits added a pulsating color to the weapon's body, and professional kits added a particle effect to the eye of your mercenary when you got a large enough killstreak. 
The second new kind of items were pure gold weapons called Australians. While TF2 had had premium hats for years, Australian weapons were the game's first iteration of premium weapons, and it's hard to imagine they could have been executed any better. Australian weapons were simply gorgeous to look at, and their fancy shiny exterior perfectly embodied their exclusive nature. Like unusuals, Australians were extremely rare and expensive, and quickly became some of the most universally liked items in the game. One Australian weapon, however, was especially rare, the mythical golden frying pan. While regular Australians had a roughly 4% drop rate, the golden frying pan was estimated to drop less than a hundredth of a percent of the time, immediately making it one of the rarest items in the game. Cementing its legacy as the first ever god tier weapon, the first golden frying pan sold for $5,500 cash, rivaling only elite god tier unusuals like the Burning Flames team captain. Released in mid-2014, the Love & War update proved to be just as influential. Centered around a nearly 15-minute animated short, the update added a plethora of new weapons, cosmetics, and most importantly, taunts. While in-game taunts had technically existed for years, their place in the game had always been somewhat unclear. Originally, taunts were simply associated with weapons, and each weapon had a unique taunt you could perform. Then, in 2011, the replay update introduced the first ever taunt item, the Director's Vision, and allowed players to equip it using a loadout slot called the Action Slot. Since that update, however, only a few other taunt items had been added to the game, relegating them to the back burner compared to other item types. That was until the Love & War update. In addition to more than tripling the number of taunts in the game, the update moved taunts from the action slot to a massive 8-slot taunt section in the loadout menu, and introduced the first ever taunt-specific crate, the Manco Audition Reel. What made this crate especially exciting, however, were the unusuals. If a player managed to unbox an unusual out of the crate, instead of receiving an unusual hat, they received a brand new unusual taunt. When unusual taunts were first revealed, there was an incredible amount of hype behind them. Most players had naturally assumed there would only ever be one kind of unusual in the game, so when Valve unexpectedly added a second kind, one that could sport even larger and flashier effects than hats, players were blown away. As unusual taunts started to surface on TF2 Outpost, many received incredibly high offers, on par with some of the best first-gen or Halloween unusuals in the game. This hype wouldn't die down anytime soon, and Unusual Taunts soon gathered a reputation as some of the game's best Unusuals. Unusuals were the highlight of other updates during this time. In June 2013, Valve introduced a third generation of basic hat effects, replacing second gen effects in all crates released after Crate 57. Like Unusual Taunts, third gen effects had a lot of hype behind them, but this excitement would quickly wear off. In July, a content pack known as the Summer Event 2013 introduced a record-breaking 8 new crates at once, each of which could drop the new 3rd gen effects. As players unboxed these new crates in mass, 3rd gen effects eventually flooded the market, and prices begun to fall. Although effects like Cloud9 and Disco Beatdown were well received by the community, there simply wasn't enough demand to match supply, and 3rd gen effects soon attracted a negative stigma among traders. Other new effects held their value better. A few months prior, the Robotic Boogaloo update introduced the first set of themed effects not tied to a Halloween event. Matching the update's theme of robots and machinery, each effect featured a unique industrial or chemical look and could only be unboxed out of the new Robo community crate. The update was also noteworthy in other ways, as it was the first major update created entirely by the community and introduced a series of robotic hats dubbed Robo Hats for short, they were simply metal versions of existing hats. In December 2014, the otherwise disappointing end of the line update introduced new effects in the same way, this time themed around the update's animated short. In general, themed effects like these tended to be good looking, and because they were limited to specific crates, they were nearly as rare and expensive as Halloween effects. But it wasn't just new effects impacting the high tier market. During this time, a stream of subtle patch notes begun to shake up high-tier trading in a different way, this time by introducing new unusual misks. While Valve had always been open to the idea of converting existing hats to misks, 
By 2013, the number of new unusual MISCs had slowed to a crawl, and it seemed like Valve was no longer interested in updating existing unusuals. That was until 2014. Starting with the virtual viewfinder in January, Valve went on to update almost a dozen unusuals over the course of the year, inciting a craze among unusual traders. Since new unusual mists would naturally explode in price once updated, traders began to speculate on what accessory looking hats could be converted next, and started to hoard these hats in large quantities. While some bets like the Mining Light and the Pyromancer's Mask paid off, Others like the otolaryngologist mirror for the medic never came to fruition. As exciting as trading was during this time, this prosperous era would end on a more somber note. In early 2015, the TF2 economy witnessed the demise of one of the game's most iconic and beloved currencies, the earbuds. Throughout 2010 and 2011, buds held a price of less than 15 keys. As the player base expanded and earbuds became more and more of a status symbol, their price steadily increased over time, reaching a peak of 28 keys in October 2012. Around early 2013, however, buds started to slowly decline in value, eventually falling below 20 keys that October. At the time, most traders assumed this dip was caused by dupe buds flooding the market, and most expected buds to eventually stabilize again once Valve cracked down on Steam support scammers. Unfortunately, this didn't end up being the case. By early 2014, buds showed no sign of recovery, constantly fluctuating between 15 to 20 keys. While it's hard to pinpoint the exact cause of these fluctuations, the cause of what happened next is very clear. In September 2014, earbuds became marketable, allowing them to be sold on the Steam community market. Because items on the Steam market could be sold faster and in higher volume than in in-person trading, the marketability of buds exacerbated buds' existing instability. Over the next few months, a particularly bad downturn would absolutely crush the price of buds, culminating in buds reaching just 10 keys by March 2015. While buds could have theoretically recovered just as quickly, something unexpected happened instead. The community started to panic. Few traders could recall buds ever being this low, and their depreciation didn't look like it was stopping anytime soon. Experienced traders started selling their buds in record numbers, a feat that snowballed into a massive panic sell. Everyone was hedging their bets, and nobody wanted to be stuck with an item that could be utterly worthless in just a few weeks. By the time buds reached 8 keys, the longtime currency had crossed the point of no return. In the weeks ahead, buds would slowly lose the rest of their value, eventually settling at a price of about 3 to 4 keys. On March 31st, 2015, Backpack.tf made a shocking, yet inevitable announcement. Effective immediately, earbuds were no longer an official form of currency on the website. Based on historical values, the prices of all high-tier items were converted into keys, effectively cementing earbuds as a currency of the past. At the time, it felt like TF2 had witnessed its first economic crash. Because high-tier items were priced on Backpack.tf using earbuds, as the price of buds fell, so did the perceived value of players' inventories. Although unusuals maintained most of their value throughout the ordeal, any trader stuck holding earbuds lost a fortune. Just like those before them, many veteran traders saw the fall of the buds as the end of trading and cashed out what value they still had. That said, despite what some thought at the time, the fall of the buds was ultimately a good thing for the economy. Earbuds had proven themselves to be incredibly unstable, and each time buds went up or down in value, so did the value of unusuals and other high-tier items. With the prices of unusuals now tied to the value of a key, high-tier items were now more stable than ever before. Once more, TF2 had largely outgrown the need for a high-tier currency. Since the introduction of Steam trading in 2011, there was no longer a restrictive cap on the number of items you could trade at the same time, meaning keys could just as easily replace earbuds in any high-tier trade. While it might take a lot of counting to trade for a god-tier unusual, this wasn't something most people had to deal with. The fall of the earbuds would prove to be the tip of an iceberg of change. By the end of the year, Valve had flipped the TF2 update formula on its head, replacing their traditional approach with a new modern framework, one that would have a lasting impact on the economy for years to come. 